I'm going to introduce, uh, oh, here's the whole panel. Um, I'll introduce the panel, and um, again, you can look, every one of these people has a day-long bio, but I will give you the short, the highlights, and um, introduce them to you. Uh, we will start with Gus Speth. Uh, Gus is uh, formerly with, at Vermont Law School until very recently, before that was the head of the um, head of the Yale School of Forestry and Environment, and before that, this is a resume that you, some people think must have been made up, head of the United Nations Development uh, Program. He was one of the founders of NRDC and also founded the World Resources Institute. Most importantly, he is the father of Catherine, who just spoke. Um, he will be followed by Stephen Rockefeller. Stephen uh, is a part-time resident of Charleston and a great birder. Um, he, was a, he was a professor of religion at Middlebury College for many years. Um, he has been at uh, Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary. Um, he's written a book on John Dewey, Religious Faith and Democratic Humanism. Um, and I think, at least for most of our purposes, probably our awareness of Stephen is his involvement with the Earth Charter, which he helped organize, direct, and uh, author. David Orr is at Oberlin College, and David has uh, been here before, about 20, I guess 20 years ago, and uh, has developed a time machine at Oberlin, which allows him to look exactly like he did when he was here 20 years ago. And um, he has uh, written a number of wonderful books uh, and has also been a real activist in Oberlin, not only at the college but in the community and moving a, an area that has a, a real economic connection to coal toward, a, toward an energy future that is not based on coal, not solely based on coal, and perhaps not at all based on coal. Um, he, David has also got a connection with South Carolina in that when he was younger, his parents knew Archibald Rutledge, and he spent time on the Santee River and um, had some great, um, I think, experiences and remembrances of the Low Country before it was quite like it is today. So um, we'll start with Gus, and again, thank you to all of the panelists for coming. I want to congratulate Dana and all of you who've worked so hard for this past quarter century to put this league in the very top rank, very top ranks of U.S. environmental organizations, bar, bar none. Uh, one of the very, very best that we have. And what a group has been assembled here uh, to reflect on where the league has been and where it ought to go uh, in the next uh, quarter century. And I congratulate you for launching such a searching inquiry and an open-ended one where we're going to explore all kinds of crazy issues. Uh, if, um, if, this, if, if my talk to you today were, I'm gonna take my watch out here. I didn't have it one time at Yale when I was talking and I ran over badly and I apologized to the students and one of them stood up and he said, Dean Speth, it's okay, there's a calendar on the wall behind you. <laughs> uh, I think the, um, but if, if this talk were, were uh, miraculously part of the uh, Canterbury Tales, it would be called the Environmentalist Tale. And uh, I actually want to relate to you that story. Uh, and it ends in a way, uh, or sort of mid-passage in that story, is that we're losing far, far too often today. Uh, and so the story uh, ends with trying to figure out how we can get back uh, and start winning again, and, and what is the League's role uh, in that? So, of course, the story begins in, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly the Earth Day in 1970, the first Earth Day. This was the Big Bang, uh, when the modern American environmental movement uh, uh, really, really got launched. Uh, but it wasn't just a celebration, it wasn't just the birth of a movement. Uh, this was a period, if you go back and look at what people were saying, uh, around 1970. It was a period of deep searching inquiry 
and really uh, profound thought about what it was going to take to deal with our environmental issues in this country and around the world. Uh, people questioned consumerism. Uh, they questioned whether the lifestyle that we had uh, in that era, which uh, hasn't improved much, uh, uh, would be possible to continue if we really wanted to do the right thing for the environment. Um, there was a healthy skepticism of, uh, of GDP and, and the goal of endlessly ratcheting up GDP. You remember, may remember that Robert Kennedy's uh, last great speech was in 1968 when he, uh, and it was a stinging indictment of this GDP fetish uh, and growth fetish that we have uh, in the country. Uh, he said it measures everything but what really matters. Um, and then there were, there were real doubts also about whether uh, our environmental goals could succeed in a society that was so, so riven uh, with inequality and injustice and social disparity. And that we needed to, if we were going to achieve our environmental goals, we needed to deal with our social issues as well. And uh, so this was a period of great, uh, great reflection and, and deep thinking about the needs. And well, then I also remember that, you know, going back to Earth Day, um, my wife Cameron and I uh, were on the mall in 1970, April, uh, for that first Earth Day, and we had our uh, little uh, one-year-old uh, daughter uh, with us there running around. You just saw her. I asked her permission to say that because now you know how old she is. Uh, and so there we go. Um, I was just out of law school then, and we were launching the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, at that point. When we started with NRDC and Dreaming It Up, we had no idea that we, there, was, there was no federal environmental law. There was hardly any federal, any environmental law at all to speak of. We thought we were going to have to use tort law and land law and nuisance law and things like that to get the job done. Well, then the revolution hit. And between late 1969 and 1972, uh, we passed uh, the National Environmental Policy Act the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and all of a sudden we had this uh, book full of the most powerful environmental laws imaginable, uh, certainly at that time imaginable. And we haven't seen the likes of them since, uh, here or indeed uh, elsewhere. They were unprecedented, unprecedented in their strength. And so what we saw was, wow, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to uh, to make, to go to D.C. and make these laws work. And so there was this movement of all the, a lot of environmental focus into, into Washington, and we began to, to work the agencies, to lobby, to litigate, to raise public awareness, and we forgot all about that deep thinking about what it was really going to take, because to our amazement, we already had the laws and a lot of politicians on our side. And, uh, and so we were thus swooped up in this moment, uh, swooped up and dropped down inside the Washington Beltway, uh, where we still are uh, nationally. Uh, and, uh, and we did. We did make these laws work for a long time. Uh, and it was beautiful. Uh, but then, 1980, and, uh, and uh, President Reagan was elected campaigning vigorously against the environment, uh, making fun of a lot of the things uh, that were going on and that we were, uh, and we should have seen this. This was a sea change in, in the public support, in the direction of things, and we didn't, really. Uh, and we should have noticed that even a lot earlier in 1971, uh, Lewis Powell, who was shortly to become a justice of the Supreme Court, wrote a long memo to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Chamber of Commerce, which has very little to do with all the local chambers of commerce around our country, urging them to get busy fighting back uh, these efforts to, to regulate, uh, to tax, uh, to, uh, you know, to promote social goals uh, through government uh, action, that it was anti-business and, and, and the chamber did. And over time, that opposition has grown and grown uh, and grown. Environmentalists got uh, a faster start, uh, but the, the rise 
uh, of the conservative opposition to environmentalism uh, was slower but stronger. And over great time, the intervening decades, uh, we have come to the point that we now have to face this paradox. Uh, you know, environmentalism is growing in strength and number and sophistication, uh, but the environment continues to go downhill. And progress is now slow. In many areas, it seems impossible. And uh, Lord knows we do need to make progress because this now 43 years after that Earth Day, we're clearly on the path to ruining the planet for our children and grandchildren. And that's where we are. I won't cite chapter and verse to you. I think you'd know this. What we've been doing all of these decades isn't wrong. It's just not enough. And especially it's not enough to win if given the opposition and given the, what we're up against. So my conclusion is that if we want to save and restore this land for our children and our grandchildren, we're going, going to have to build a new environmentalism in America. And the process of building that new environmentalism in America starts, I think, with asking a very basic, very simple question. And that question is, what is an environmental issue? What is an environmental issue? What should be an environmental issue? What are the proper concerns of those who would leave to our future generations on Earth restored uh, and, and whole? Well, certainly air pollution and water pollution and biodiversity protection, uh, climate action, these are certainly environmental issues. But is it the best answer, the best answer to what is an environmental issue is that it is whatever has a big impact on environmental outcomes, right? An environmental issue, uh, it are, what are those things that are driving environmental losses today? What are those things that are limiting our capacity to deal with those environmental losses? That is the fundamental question, I think, and that, I think, is the best answer. And if we use this frame uh, and ask anew what it then is an environmental issue, what are the real determinants of our success and our failure, then you come up with a list like this, I think. Uh, certainly the state of our politics, the health of our democracy, political accountability, transparency, good ethics, uh, certainly a big factor is our consumerism, our affluenza, and the transcending that with new lifestyles. <coughs> certainly a big factor that affecting environmental outcomes are the values that guide us. The level of our consciousness of what's going on and what needs to be uh, done, our spirituality, and the issues that Stephen Rockefeller, I'm sure, will address with you and others later in the program. Our prospects for environmental success will depend also mightily on whether we measure and pursue the things that truly make us better off, as Bobby Kennedy urged, or whether we continue this pursuit of mindless development and, and, uh, and, and mere GDP, uh, which grows an awful lot of bad things rather than focusing on the things that we really, truly do need to grow, and they are many uh, also. Uh, our success depends on whether we have an equitable and just society. What could be harder than trying to do the most basic thing environmentalists want to do, and that is to get the prices right in the market, in a market society, to have environmentally honest prices, with half the families in the country are living paycheck to paycheck when 40% of the American families are living on incomes no more than twice the poverty level. You know, we can't be, hope uh, to advance environmental objectives in the way that we need to, like putting a price on carbon, uh, if we persist with this highest level of inequality that we've had since the 20s and poverty at an all-time high uh, in our country and a middle class with the bottom falling out and our 
citizens frightened. Um, our success depends on whether we are able to move beyond working with elected officials to electing officials. Uh, it depends on whether we are content to stick with our tribe uh, or whether we see the need to reach out beyond the middle class and embrace all of society, all races, all minorities, all faiths, all neighborhoods, labor as well as management, the poor as well as the rich. Our success depends on whether we accept our somewhat old and now somewhat slow movement as the best we can do, or whether we truly start building a new and vital grassroots force, a movement transformative uh, in its demand uh, for a country fit for our children and our grandchildren. And it depends on whether we are able to bring the future into the present locally, in our communities, now, without waiting for Washington. Localism more than localism. And the food issue is just the entering wedge of the dramatic changes uh, in these directions. I'm so proud of what the League is doing in that area, in that, that branching out. So I think these are the new environmental issues that environmental success depends on. We've got to find ways uh, to address these issues as well as their traditional agenda. So here, in the end, is my hope for the League, Dana and others. I hope that you'll find a way to be this new environmentalism, that you will find ways to challenge the real root causes of our environmental distress, that you'll promote David Orr's concept of full-spectrum sustainability, and in so doing, be the organization that's concerned about caring and fighting for a healthy environment, yes, but also about caring and fighting for a healthy democracy and a healthy, inclusive society. Uh, in sum and in conclusion, I hope the League will do the hard, transformative things uh, needed to make the future be the one that we would like to see for our children and grandchildren, to make that future come alive here, now, in this place. Thank you. Since we have three speakers, and that was a fantastic start, that's going to be a hard one to keep that level up, but we can do it. Um, we've, we also, we wanted to break the, the speaking up and have the panelists or ask, inter interact, engage the, the speaker, Gus, uh, on anything that David, you or Stephen feel you'd like elaborated on, um, or if you don't, then I'll ask a question. But have you all got a comment you'd like to make? Uh, well, Gus, I was wondering, having your experience around the country is extensive, and having lived in Vermont, you've got that very local experience, and then, of course, in Connecticut and New York, too. But what have you seen institutions that you feel um, reflect the, the parts of, and I don't know that there's a single institution that does this, but the, these new this new evolving type of environmentalism, have you seen examples that you feel we could look to to emulate or learn from? Well, well, two things, uh, Dana. Uh, first and foremost, they are in this room today with us, the representatives of the organizations that are doing fantastic things. Uh, around the country, and we will hear from them in this program. I, I, you know, I think the agenda is fabulous, and I'm not going to start naming names uh, because there are too many. Uh, and then I would just add that, um, that secondly, um, you know, what we haven't had is, is sort, of, sort of umbrella organization for people that are working on these many different issues. Um, 
and uh, that, that I've ticked off and, and others. Uh, and we haven't had that umbrella organization and we need this watering hole where everybody can come together and, and look across the table and whether they're working on you know, new types of business enterprises, uh, locally rooted, uh, or whether they're working on you know, values and changing values in education or consumerism or you know, uh, traditional environmental issues or whatever. They look around the table and see their strength and their number. So we're trying to launch now something called the New Economy Coalition. Uh, and it's currently based in Boston. And it, the, uh, the, the website is actually uh, uh, the New Economics uh, Institute. And uh, we decided we didn't like that very much. So we were changing the name. Uh, but if you want to go to the website, it's www.neweconomicsinstitute.org. Uh, but you'll see there that we're trying to build a coalition of all of these different uh, uh, sort of points on the compass of groups working in, uh, in this area. So when we get that done, I think that'll be a real strengthening in providing kind of a backbone institution for a, a lot of uh, the, the issues that I've been over and others. Thank you. Good, good. Uh, well, and I will say Gus's book, uh, most recent book is called America the Possible. And we have, we have the books here. We have a lot, most of these, many of these speakers have books. Uh, some very recent, like Judy Wicks and others have been out for a while that are still wonderful, like some of David's classics, but um, if you are interested in it, I guess we have them available outside. <laughs>